Also, welcome to you who are joining us online. We're glad you're with us as well. You'll find in the chat room somewhere or on our website the notes from today. I'm not going to cover every single thing on my notes, but uh, they're there for you to examine. Also, special welcome to our uh, Myanmar congregation. Glad that you are here with us today. We are together. Yeah, that's right. They typically meet at one o'clock, and about four times a year we gather together as we are connecting and cross-pollinating, if that's a word, our congregations because we are one. And there's two different languages, two different um, uh, groups of people that are one group of people with the same heartbeat, the same focus, the same connection. We share this place, but we are together. So grateful that you're here today uh, with us as well. Special welcome to you if you're a guest today. We're glad that you're here. We believe that the Holy Spirit brought you here. It wasn't your mother, even though yay for your mom or your grandmother or whomever. We pray for this time together specifically. We pray that God would meet with us. We pray that we would hear him. We pray that our hearts would be open to him. We pray that his word would be proclaimed. We pray these things because we need God's work among us, okay? I can only do so much. Actually, I can do about this much. And God has to do, do the rest. And so we pray for that. The Holy Spirit would meet us. So I don't know what you're coming in with today, right? You might be carrying a lot of things. I don't know how your week was. I know just a little, but I do trust that God would meet you today. And so that is my heartbeat. That is our heartbeat as a church, that God would speak to us, move among us, have his way in us, transform us so that we would be like him. So we speak from the Bible, and we believe that's the authoritative, infallible word of God, and there's a lot in it. So every week you're going to hear that from me. You're going to hear that from those who are speaking up here. And by the way, grateful for, for Tom. Where are you, Tom, for speaking last week? Thank you, Tom. And Rick and Pastor Michael is going to be speaking next week, and I'm grateful that we have people in our congregation who have the courage to step up to a place like this and speak from the Word of God, because it is scary, okay, <laughs> and it is dangerous, and I know this from experience, and this is why it's that way. Scripture tells us that those who teach in the church will be judged more strictly, okay? What we're doing is for us, but ultimately, standing in a place like this or speaking from the Word of God, we are communicating God's Word to people. And we have to be careful, those of us who are called to do this type of thing, it is a heavy burden, right? And so we have to recognize that it takes courage to stand up and say these things in light of the fullness of the glory of God. Second, when you speak from a pulpit or from the Word of God, sometimes people actually listen to you. I know it's shocking, right? And they say, hey, and it helps to form, formulate their idea of God and understanding of who He is and what's required of us. And it affects our lives, how we live. So it is powerful, and we have to be careful with things that are powerful. That's why there's so many regulations around nuclear power or grenades or scissors, right? Don't carry them around, right? Things that have power, we have to be careful, and it affects our lives. And thirdly, it affects eternity, okay? This is a weight that is on those who God calls to proclaim his word, okay? And it is a joy and a privilege, but it's also a weighty responsibility. And that weight, hopefully, all people who proclaim God's word in whatever format will drive us to be close to the good shepherd, right? Myself and the shepherds, the elders, that we call them the shepherding team here, are under the good shepherd, the great shepherd. 
that we are doing his ministry alongside of him, being accountable to him, and hopefully looking to him and having his heart. And so doing this type of ministry, and via Tom and via Rick and via all those who come up here, you feel that drives us hopefully to our knees, drives us to be close to the Word of God, to study, to handle it well, and present it in a way that best represents what is there. And so today's passage is a pretty heavy passage. It represents God in a way that we in particular in our generation and in America don't necessarily like. Like we read a psalm this morning and I told Dionysia, read Psalm 35, okay? That's a heavy psalm. It's called a precatory psalm. That It is praying to God, and she did it so right, saying, God, do you see what is taking place? Habakkuk, who we are spending time with, has the same cry right from the beginning. Right? Do you remember this? How long, O oh Lord, must I view violence? Must there be injustice that people are getting, quote unquote, getting away with all of these wicked things? And God, I'm looking around and it looks like that they're going to get away with it forever. God, where are you? How long am I supposed to wait for justice and for righteousness and rightness? I hope at times you feel that way because there are injustices that are happening on a large scale with wars in Jerusalem, with wars in Myanmar, with wars in Ukraine in various places. This is a macro level. And then it happens in various small ways that are big to us because it comes towards us. And the forms of people in power or the forms of people that you love. I have seen evil, and there is evil in this world. We can't just say, well, you know, evil, it's okay. It's not okay, right? It's not okay when people take advantage of those who are vulnerable. It's not okay when people go on rampages and kill people. It's not okay when we twist people's reputations or do violence to other people. It's not okay. And we, as people of faith, if you are a person of faith, have to say, God, what are you going to do about this? Now, granted, is God a God of love? We can say, absolutely right. But saying he's love and that's it, we kind of take that word and say, well, love means that everything's going to be okay, (laughs) right? And everything is okay. I love my children. We have two girls, right? Because I love them, I told them that some of what they did wasn't okay, right? And because what I love, because I love other people and how they treat them, how I treat them, because I love other people, it's not okay, Because God is love, he's also just, he is also righteous, he's also powerful, he's incredibly wise, he is indeed our good father, he is our sovereign Lord, he is the maker of all things. Because he is loving, he has to deal with sin and injustice and unrighteousness. And so we'll see in this passage as Habakkuk is struggling. We go back and forth, and Tom talked about this last week, what God is doing and what's happening and how he's dealing with injustice. And this morning, we're going to see God kind of roar forward as Habakkuk then is, by the Spirit of God, looking back in Scripture to the flood, looking back in Scripture to Exodus, And knowing that this is the God, and by the way, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The God that we have today isn't, well, we have the New Testament God and the Old Testament God. It's the same God, right? And there's echoes in what he's saying that that harken back to Exodus and harken back to Noah and the flood and point forward to the book of Revelation. And at the end of your notes, you're going to see I put in there, I'm not going to go through all of that, some comparisons. You and I have to deal with the God who reveals himself as he is in Scripture. And if we have a distorted, perverted, 
understanding of God, our life comes out distorted and perverted. Either that God is just anger and wrath, and people tend to believe that or tend to be pretty legalistic, right? And the other side of this perspective are those who just view God as a God of love, and they get real liberal and mushy about stuff. Is God powerful, and does He deal with sin and unrighteousness? Yes! Is God loving and forgiving and merciful? Yes! In wrath, remember mercy, covenant, love. And so we see both of these elements in God. Last weekend, I was spending time with my family. I was spending time with my mom on Mother's Day, and we attended a service. I was sitting in that service, and I almost didn't make it through. (laughs) Beautiful campus, five acres, beautiful couple services, hundreds of people. And the communicator, the pastor that morning, was, was talking about a series on loving your neighbor. Now, is loving your neighbor a good thing? Yeah, right? And she was talking about Romans chapter 12. I'm like, oh, I know this passage, right? It does talk about loving our neighbor, and that is a good thing. And then in that passage, it talks about leave room for the wrath of God, right? And a little bit later on at the end of the passage, it talks about in doing these good things, you're heaping like coals on the head of your enemy. I'm like, huh. I wonder how she's going to handle that. And I was looking around. Bless her. She read it. Read the passage. However, getting to this part, right, she goes, oh, Paul. Like she's blaming it on Paul. Paul, we don't believe. We believe that God is love and God doesn't have wrath. She said that from the pulpit. And I'm looking around. She's blaming it on Paul. It's like, oh, if you're going to say that, well, it's just Paul's word. So, so is the Bible not inspired or not? Is this not the authoritative word of God or is it not? If you're going to say that to Paul, you have to say that to Peter. You have to say that to John. You have to say that to uh, James. You'll have to say it to the writer of Hebrews. You're going to have to say it to all the minor prophets. You're going to have to say it to King David. You're going to have to say it to everyone in there. I had a hard time being there. Oh, Paul, it's just Paul. We believe in the God and the love. Everything's okay. Everything's not okay. And we cannot take God's word and twist it to fit our image of what we want God to be like. We have to accept God for who he reveals himself to be through Scripture. We don't, if, if we make a God in our own image, guess what that's called? An idol. We're called to be made in God's image and conform ourselves to God. And if you don't like things that are in Scripture, you're out of line, not Scripture. Okay? So we have to conform ourselves to what is written. That's why I tell you over and over and over again, the best thing that you can do is read the Word. Okay? Please, I plead with you, read it. Why? It's good for you. It'll challenge you. It'll change you. The word is, by the way, living and active, right? It's just not a written book. It's just not literature. All these are nice thoughts or some interesting thoughts by some of these people. It is the word of God. We read the book of Revelation and the end of it, you ever read the very, very end of it? The very end says, hey, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We say, yes, right before that it says, hey, hey, hey. Anyone who adds to this book, may the curses in this book fall upon them. Ugh. Anyone who takes away, may God take away their portion of the tree of life. That's darn stuff. Right? That's not, quote, unquote, nice. It is nice. It is true. It is right and righteous. And that phrase in the book of Revelation does not just cover that book, but it covers the entire book. We have to be careful. Right? We need teachers and get good teachers. I give you notes so you can examine this. I put scriptures in there so you know I'm not making stuff up, right? 
You need to look at what I say or what is said from this place, and you need to look at other place that claims to speak from this book. There are false teachers, and there are people that will lead you astray. So know the book for your own sake, right? And I, by the way, when I am dead, don't want to look back and you guys look to me and say, Dave, why don't you ever tell us about this, right? I don't want to be that guy, right? I don't, I don't know if I can des- <laughs> describe what we read in the book of Revelation strong enough. We're all going to experience it, by the way. I'm thinking we're all going to be on, this, uh, on the other side, but we will see it. We'll have to see. Right? But these things are going to occur regardless of if I think they should or not, regardless of my opinion or your opinion. God does not conform himself to your opinion. He is who he is. It's who he reveals himself to us. So Habakkuk in Scripture deal with the God who is. The God in His grace revealing Himself through His Word, in His Spirit, by His Son, through the prophets. Revealing Himself through what is made. We can know things about this God. And so we humble ourselves to it. And we put ourselves under it. And we deal with God for whom he reveals himself to be. He is the creator. We are the creatures. And he invites us to be like him. He invites us to have relationship with him. He invites us to talk to him. That's mind-blowing. If you don't understand what a significant invitation we have to talk to the living God, you're getting prayer wrong. Right? That's incredible. That the God of the universe, the God of billions of people, the God who speaks and things happen, the God who shows up and uh, mountains melt, the God who speaks and seas divide, the God who commands frogs and gnats and flies and all types of stuff, gives us an invitation to talk with him. And it gets more scandalous. He adopts us as his children. That's mind-blowing. And so we have to understand what we have in the God who indeed loves us, but he's not a God to be trifled with, right? He's not a God to just say, oh, everything is going to be just fine for everybody, because in the end, love wins, as defined by Rob Bell. It's not defined that way. Yes, love wins, in the sense that God is sovereign. And because he loves his children, he has to deal with sin and wrongdoing. Even in our lives, right? That's what Christ came for. To reveal the Son of God. To reveal God, absolutely. And who he is. He walked in what? Grace and mercy, and he walked in truth. Knowing that God indeed loves the world. Knowing because he's loving, he has to be just. And so his justice was met by pouring out his, hear me, wrath against sin. On Christ the sinless Son of God, that in him we can have mercy from the wrath of God against sin. Do you understand how this works? So I want you to get your mind around who God is. And when you are reading scripture for yourself, please read it. Well, I've never read the Bible. Start with the Gospel of John. Go forward. Come back. You can go through this and pray a simple prayer. God, show me what's true about you. God, speak to me in this word. Show me what is real. And when you're reading, okay, take a pen or however, take your finger if you're reading it on, whatever. Highlight passages that describe God. 
What did you learn about God in this passage? That will help you because we become like what we worship. Do you hear me? Okay. Be it a sports star or a celebrity or someone with a lot of money or whatever it is, someone who's super smart, what we emulate, what we, quote-unquote, idolize, what we worship in a sense, look to, that's what we become like. So what are you becoming like, and who are you worshiping, and what, quote-unquote, God are you following? These are serious things, and the Bible is no ordinary work. Habakkuk chapter 3, okay? I'm going to go back a little bit. I'm going to hinge forward, taking one verse that Michael's going to take next week. So understand, this is Habakkuk's response. Go listen to the message from last week. It starts this way, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 1. This is a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shang, Shang Gudainoth. Okay, it's an instrument. Lord, this meant to be sung. Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. This is significant. Again, reflecting on what God has done. God, will you do it today? Right? Repeat it in our day. Make yourself known in our day. That's a good prayer. In context, he's talking about violence. He's talking about injustice. He's talking about crime and things that are just sinful and wrong and sick. Right? God, will you deal with these things? And also, God, <laughs> remember mercy. Because if God dealt with all sins immediately based upon who he is and his perfection, there's not a hope for any of us. Ten Commandments, this dude broke them all. What? You're a pastor. Yeah, I'm a person too, right? Well, Dave, how, how do you say that? Uh -huh. Have you ever heard this sermon? It's called the Sermon on the Mount, John chapter 5, 6 and 7. Dave, have you ever killed somebody? I've killed them in my heart. <laughs> right? Isn't that what Jesus say? Well, I'm never murdered. Have you ever been angry with somebody? Let me get back to you on that. <laughs> it's who we are. Granted, there's consequences of greater degree if we follow out on those things. And, by the way, rightly so. Right? In your wrath against sin and against justice, Habakkuk, remember mercy. So it tells us we have to be in the mercy of God or you will experience the wrath of God. Pick your path. I, for one, want to be in the mercy of God, which means I have to be in the provision of God, which is, comes in the Son of God. Right? That we are in Him, and He's an invitation that He extends even to you today. So I want us desperately to understand the God who presents himself as he is, not as you want. Okay? And in the end, you want the God who is, but you have to conform yourself to understanding who he is. It is a lifelong pursuit, and this will continue to expand throughout glory. There's much more of God than you and I currently understand. I just want to let you know that. That is good news. So Habakkuk is understanding that God's going to use these Babylonians. God's going to use the Babylonians or those who are in Babel, which is a specific people at a specific time, but it's also symbolic of those who do evil and who do wickedness and who use their power to destroy and to crush other people for their own benefit. Do a little study on that throughout Scripture, by the way. You will see it, and you will see it in the book of Revelation, where God finally, in his final judgment, deals with, quote-unquote, Babylon. Okay? 
It's important for us to understand. There are some types here. So, four points. <laughs> God is expansively glorious. This might not be the right words, but this is what I am saying to see this picture of God. I want you to understand God is expansively glorious. Habakkuk chapter 3, starting or continuing in verse 3. So here he is now by the Holy Spirit. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens. We're talking about his glory covered the heavens. His praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hands where his power was hidden. This is a vision of God as he is meeting with his people who he just delivered, by the way, and he's going to go into this, from slavery, from bondage, from sin. This is the type of God delivering us from his sin, where God displayed his power. This is in the south part of Israel. This is the place where they got the law of God. This is where God met with Moses on the mountain. And it was so fearful, the people said, we can't look at this. And God had to cover himself on the mountain. And Moses showed up with his face glowing because he was in the God's presence. This is an image of God meeting with his people, preparing his people, showing his splendor, displaying his glory. Pillar of cloud during the day, pillar of fire by night, God speaking in power. So Habakkuk is bringing forth this image of God's glory and his splendor and his praise and his power. God is expansively glorious beyond this world, beyond your comprehension. All of creation, including billions and billions of galaxies that we're just getting little glimpses of all created by God, but it all even cannot contain him. He is above and beyond his creation, but he interacts with us. When Christ comes back, his glory is going to be seen everywhere. It's not just a localized deity to a localized group of people. Nonsense. Every tongue will confess. Every knee will bow. Every person will behold the King coming in His glory. We wait for this. We long for this. We prepare for this. God is expansively glorious. We see that in this remembering of Him. Second, God is overwhelmingly powerful. Overwhelmingly. He describes this in Habakkuk 3, 5 through 7. Now check out this description. Put it in your mind. When I've read this, it's like, this is like a Marvel character coming out, right? If you know about those movies. God, excuse me, plagues went before him, verse 5, right? Habakkuk 3, 5. Plague went before him. Oh, pestilence followed his steps. Oh, he stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapse. But he marches on forever. I saw the tents of Kushan in distress and the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Let's just stop there. Is this the image you have of God? Well, we prefer 
Jesus in the manger, the one that we can coddle and control. Did Jesus come in the flesh? Absolutely. Image, exact representation of God. He did it to show God's mercy and grace and His character, but He is not a God to be trifled with. So Habakkuk looks back, and he thinks about the plagues of Exodus. Who did those plagues, by the way? God did those plagues as he, this is important, delivered his people from sin and slavery and wicked rulers. Plagues went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. Excuse me. This is water turning to blood. Remember that? This is multitudes of frogs invading the land because the God who created them is the God who commands them. This is gnats swarming like the darkest night. This is flies overwhelming all life. This is livestock all dropping dead. This is boils appearing on skin of his enemies. This is hail. Read this in, 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 in Exodus. It'll blow your mind. When's the last time you read it and understood the power of God. Hail destroying everything. If that wasn't enough, locusts consuming all things that grow. If that wasn't enough, stifling darkness where they couldn't even see their hand in front of their face. If that wasn't enough, death to the firstborn. Get your mind around the totality of who God is. He is powerful. He is mighty. Why did he show himself this way? So we can understand his glory and understand his love. Understand this. Dealing with the wickedness of the world and the wickedness of our hearts. That's why there was a Passover lamb. Do you understand the typology? Something taking the penalty for sin because God, to be good, has to deal with evil. If he doesn't, he's not good. But provision of his mercy pointed to Christ, the ultimate, final, sacrificial lamb, the lamb who was slain before the creation of the world, according to Revelation. Do you understand this? Giving us a covering because of our own sin. This, by the way, is echoed in the book of Revelation. You'll see it at the end of the notes. Okay? These are God dealing with sin. And it is frightening. I saw the tents of Cushan. These are the enemies of God at that time. Looking back, the drawings of Midian in anguish recognizing who this God was, and yet they still fought against him. As people still fight against the people of God to our day, and against ultimately God. Now, Habakkuk continues in helping us remember the overwhelming power of God. He goes down to, in verse 8, continues this way, God, were you angry with the rivers, Lord? Is thinking of the flood. <laughs> was there wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode your horses and your chariots to victory? You uncovered your bow. You called for many arrows, torrents of rain, torrents of hail. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and withered. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Who did this? God did this. He called for it. Why? Because of the wickedness of his creation. And even in his wrath, he remembered mercy. In the ark, do you remember that? 
a picture of Christ, by the way. People who heard him, followed him, obeyed him, committed to him. In his wrath, he remembered mercy and the things that we see of unmovable, like the mountains, right? We saw this before, the things that we say, pieces of granite that are going to be here long, they were here long before us, they're going to be here long after us. We look at mountains and say, man, these things are ancient, they're unmovable. God laughs at it. The only unmovable thing in the universe is God Almighty, the ancient things see him, and he just marches on. <laughs> you are not going to stop God. You can relate to him. You can be adopted by him. You can know him. That's incredibly, again, mind-blowing. See, isn't the deist understanding of God that he created everything and just took a break? This isn't the gods of ancient Greek that are wrestling with one another and who to be the strongest. This is God Almighty. He can do these things. And Habakkuk is saying, hey, were you mad at the rivers when you broke them open? He's reminding us that this is the God who will deal with Sin. You say, well, well, I don't see it right now. People get a lot away with a lot of stuff. They do. For a time. There's consequences. God gives us opportunity to receive his grace. Even in jail cells. But God is... And this description is just, again, not just Old Testament. It's New Testament. It's in the writings of Paul. It's in the Gospels. It's in the final revelation. These things shall point us to the grace and the mercy of God. If you don't understand the bad news, you will never receive the good news. The bad news is all have fallen short of the glory of God and all are under the wrath of God. Do you remember um, John chapter 3 where Jesus was describing these things? To Nicodemus, go read it again. Look for it. It's there. People have to understand, be convicted that we've sinned against God. A good and glorious and loving and righteous and just and perfect God. We've all trespassed. Like two-year-old toddlers, right? Don't go there. Hey, that's a great idea. We have to feel this weight. And if you feel the weight of the sin, you will to the same extent, embrace the grace of God. You understand that? I'm not saying this because, oh, you're a bad person. I'm saying this, God is a good person, and in light of him, we are really bad. But he extends grace to us. Do you understand this? Is Mary with um, the prostitutes. She's like, hey, she sinned a lot. She says, yeah, because she knows the extent of her sin, her love is that much greater. Understanding the grace of God. So Habakkuk is looking at this and he's describing God. Remember before, hey God, where are you? Hey God, you don't listen. Hey God, are you going to do anything? Hey God, (coughs) do you have any power? Right? You might ask that sometimes, well. (laughs) And God says, I'm going to do some stuff. And the Holy Spirit says, yeah, hey, I want you to remember who actually God is. He is powerful. He does hear. He is acting. He will act. He will take care of all of these things. And oh, by the way, Habakkuk, you need my mercy too. And by the way, preacher, you need my mercy too. And by by the way, you in this building, you who are listening, you need his mercy too. Run to his mercy. God will. God is overwhelmingly powerful. God is expansively glorious. God will deliver his people. Now check this out. This is what he's doing here. This is Habakkuk again. Continue to read, starting in verse 11. (laughs) Describing God, but see the extent of why he does this. Sun and moon, 
stood still in the heavens. At the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. God deals with sin and his power because of his love. You understand this? For those who have covenanted with him. In wrath, remember, mercy to those he said to Abraham and to your offspring, all who believe are of the faith of Abraham. And the quote-unquote anointed one, the promised son, who is Christ the Lord, the one and only. Salvation is found in no one else but him. He does these things to deliver his people from sin and suffering and to deliver us from our own sin and our own suffering. And don't get me wrong in thinking, well, those people are so horrible. I first look at my own heart. Whoa, you kidding me? There's so much garbage here that I hate. God, deliver me from myself. This is what we long for, a new, not just a new environment, a new heaven and earth, but we would be new. We would be new. We would be in right relationship with God and right relationship with other people, loving Him with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. We strive for this as the Spirit helps us as a deposit when you believe, transforming us through the sanctification process. Transforming how uh, we think and how we interact as we say, come, Lord Jesus. And we lament how long. And we look, yes, to overcome evil with good. Thank you, Dionysius, saying, hey, this wasn't the, 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 the psalmist taking these things on themselves. God help me as I pummel my neighbors, right, who never mow their grass. I'm not salty. I'm okay. I'm really okay. Hey, Dave, borrow me your lawnmower. Hey, Dave, go mow the lawn for them. Hey, Dave, bring them cookies. And feed their cats. Inside joke. I love cats. I love cat people. You overcome evil with good, but it's not like God won't deal with people who do not receive his goodness and his mercy. You understand that? This is what Scripture <laughs> reveals to us. God will deliver his people. This is good news. Right? Not that we're beating our chest saying, oh, we're better. We say, God is good and glorious. God is to be praised and God made a way for all people to stand rightly with him. It's called justification. Just as I have never sinned, made right in a legal sense with God, God conveys His righteousness to us as we strive to live in it, follow His Spirit. And unfortunately, we don't always get it right. Maybe you do, I don't. I'm trying. He's helping, surrendering. God will deliver His people. Last point is this. God will devour all evil. That's intentional words here. Same with delivery because it's in the text. Habakkuk 3.13, second half of that verse. You crush the leader of the land. Um, you crush the leader of the land of wickedness, right? Past tense, present tense implication, future tense fulfillment. <laughs> you stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear, the things that he was coming out to kill other people, you pierced his head. When his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding, you trampled the sea with their horses, churning the great waters. God deals with people and sin. His own spear, you pierced his head. Right? Sin and evil and all those who align themselves against God 
and his people to devour them, and the end will be devoured by the mighty might and majesty of God. <laughs> no one will stand up against him. Well, I don't believe in him. His existence is independent upon your belief. He is who he is. And the right logical person would want to know who this is and how we are to relate to this God. In steps the Holy Spirit. In steps the Son of God. In steps the Word of God. Believe or disbelieve. What is written is what is. You can squabble about various interpretations, but believe me, God is just, He is sovereign, He is mighty, He is merciful, and gives us an invitation to connect with Him. Now, after hearing all these things, revealed to Him in remembrance of what was and what is, and again, Revelation picks up this continued story of this continued imagery because it's the true thing about God, Habakkuk responds this way, and Michael will take this and unpack it next week. Please be here for that. It's important for you to hear. Habakkuk 3.16, he says, I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet, I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nations invading us. And those nations, Babylon in this case, did indeed come, did indeed destroy. As Habakkuk waited in faith that God will deal with all violence and injustice in the earth. And he starts in our own heart transforming us and helping us. This should be our response as well. God has come to the aid of his people in the past. This is summation. God certainly will come again to their rescue. And at the end of time, God will once and for all vindicate those who belong to him and will exercise judgment on those opposed to him. It's good for us to understand these things. God gives mercy to his people and wrath to his enemies because of their trespass. We hide in him or people will hide from him. Turn. So my plea. Turn to his mercy. Run to Christ. Get in the ark of God's covenant with you. Understand and wait for God to deal with evil and atrocity. And it happens. Trust that his hand is long enough. Power is greater. His plan will happen and he will make all things new again. Put your trust in Christ, the only shelter from the wrath of God against evil. This is the gospel. I hope it penetrates your heart today. Allie Rogers, where are you? There she is. Here's Allie. I'm giving it to you straight today. <laughs> Not like I don't do it other times. <laughs> but we have to understand these things. Allie Rogers is a friend of mine. She's a friend of Christ. She's a friend of the church. She's worked in ministry. A lot of different places in the modern, a lot of different ways. She is not unfamiliar with pain and suffering and injustice in her own life and in the life of the world. And so she's putting together a piece, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm setting it up, but you set it up, put together a piece to share a part of her heart, part of her story, 
to help us, to encourage us, and to um, bring us forward. So, Allie, yeah, please. Well, I agreed to speak before I read your first bullet point, so <laughs> I guess there's no turning back now. That's um, right. I have had the privilege of enduring some significant life trials. Um, just a few are open heart surgery at 19. My youngest daughter was born at two pounds and spent six weeks in the NICU. And I've experienced the grief and loss of so many things um, in tremendous ways. Loss of the facade of control. I wonder if anyone else in this room uh, can relate to that. We feel like we have control of situations in our world, and then we find out, oh, just kidding, we don't. Um, grief and loss of losing loved ones. Uh, the unraveling of my, and disillusion of my former marriage. Shattered dreams and expectations. In the last 12 months, specifically, I've lost two grandparents and a lifelong friend. And I have learned that everything in life offers a choice. <laughs> We might not always be able to choose the circumstance, right? But we can choose how we respond. And like Dave said, a lot of times we have the choice to hide from God or hide in God. We have the choice to run to God or run from God. Before I share this piece of my journey with you, I want to tell you a quick little thing. I met, um, actually, our associate pastor, Something you don't know about him is years ago, we used to do, uh, with our friend group, we'd go downtown and we would feed people on the streets that needed it. And this is something, uh, a story from back then. I met a man who said a phrase to me that would change the rest of my life. He was really, really kind and he took my hand. He didn't know me, but he said, young lady, whenever you come to a crossroads, you remember, you go with God. And I was like 19. And I was like, okay, I don't know what that means yet. But I started my journey then, right? And that was right around the time when I had open heart surgery. And that little piece, that little nugget, I took from the Lord. And I said, okay, God. And little did I know that I would encounter several crossroads. And that little nugget of wisdom is always there reminding me, I, I credit the Holy Spirit with that. Don't hide from God. Hide in God. So I'm going to share this piece of my journey in learning submission to the authority of God. Because the reality is we all, at some point in our life, are going to become familiar with what we call darkness because we're this side of eternity. And sometimes darkness is brought on by us. Sometimes darkness is brought on by other things. However, we are not going to be strangers of darkness. So God gives us wisdom in his word. And this is what words he's given me to share with you today. I don't know if anyone here has ever had a moment like the one I'm about to describe. Nothing short of miraculous to make it out alive. A moment of encountering almighty God in power and love in holiness, complete and total awareness, terrified, desperate to hide, with nowhere to go because the King of Kings, he's found me. He sees me. The Holy of Holies stooped down to meet me in my darkest night, a moment that changed me forever, the moment he called me his bride, the moment he raised dead to life, the moment he turned my darkness to light. A moment like this changes everything, at least it did for me, changes the depths of your prayers. Deeper than my eyes can behold, changes my mind to believe the things that my heart has already known, that I am never alone. This moment for me was more than a day, it was more than a year, more than one conversation. It was endless, devastating tears. When broken, shattered dreams, hopes, and expectations deep, deep lamentation. Loss and grief swelled around me like waves in a torrential storm. With no warning, the rug pulled beneath me, uncertainty all around me. Everything I thought I knew was a facade, a room of mirrors closing in. I couldn't escape the hell I was living in. I could only close my eyes in desperation, 
burdened by deprivation, everything I thought I knew was no more. How long, O oh Lord? And though I didn't get the answer, I wanted the immediate gratification of escape in that moment. I got something much better that I would never trade in. What I know now that I didn't know then was the darkness served a glorious purpose in the restoration of me. You see, when you're surrounded by darkness, when your eyes fail to see, they may in time adjust. But when you are blind, you must learn to rely on the little things on the side of your head instead, ears, to really learn how to trust and how to really hear. In this darkness, I begged and I pleaded. I needed to know I wasn't alone. To paint the picture for you to really comprehend the season I found myself standing in. Imagine. On a hilltop, the warm, beautiful glow far in the distant of the radiant sun setting on my skin. I can almost feel it, but it's not quite within reach. When then Jesus takes hold of me and whispers, that's not the way we're going. He turns me around to face the other side, the dark of the night. The sun is no longer setting ahead of me, but falling at my back. It won't be long now before everything around me is pitch black. I feel paralyzed. I don't want to move. Why wouldn't I run after the sun? I can't understand why I should follow you. The warmth, it's familiar, it's kind, it's comfortable to me. The little daylight left gives me at least something to see. Why would I turn to follow you another direction? I'm so perplexed and confused. You wouldn't lead me into the darkness ever, would you? And while my eyes fought hard to adjust to the dark sky searching before me, I knew it was time to walk by faith, not by sight. The darkness is not dark to you. But I am terrified to take a move. Then those nine little words that changed everything about the darkness enveloping me. I will be with you. I will deliver you. How long, O oh Lord? I will be with you. I will deliver you. How long, O oh Lord? I will be with you. I will deliver you. Like a child on an endless road trip, I quipped, complained, pleaded to arrive again, again, I cried. How long, O oh Lord? I will be with you. I will deliver you. I learned to listen for the voice that was leading me through the darkest night of my life. I knew he could be trusted. He's the one who could return my sight. But even if he didn't, I would continue to follow him in the night. And just when it was the coldest, darkest, loneliest part of my journey, I wondered if he heard me. I thought, maybe he's forsaken me. Did he turn left and I went right? Maybe I misheard him. Filled with fright, the doubt set in, but then the most exuberant light. The darkness was swallowed up right in front of me by a new day. But this time, it was not so far away. Purples, oranges, pinks, and reds contrasting the vibrant teals and blues. Hues I didn't know existed outside of heaven. The sun shining so brightly, the resin swallowing up any last remnants of the night. The only thing left was this glorious light. And as sure as the sun does rise, I have learned to walk by faith, not sight. For sight would have kept me from the wisdom of following Jesus into the night. I wouldn't know the depth of his great love for me, the power of his majesty, his ability to remain with me. And in all things, even in the midst of the darkest night surrounding me, his sovereignty to deliver me from every enemy and lead me into his glorious light. And this time... I know for how long, for his mercy is forevermore. Amen.
Well done, Allie. Yeah, come on up, Tim. That was great. It's great. Good theology. Good reflection. And she's been through some stuff, y'all. And so that's coming through. So grab a hold of what the Lord may be speaking to you today.